loaded. Uh, they're there. Uh, one quick comment I want to make. Um, probably never, maybe rarely, let's say, will a patient come to you saying, my chief complaint is that my valve area is 0.9 centimeters square. <laughs> and that's very important to remember because patients come in with symptoms. And valve area is a measure of severity of a stenosis, but the symptoms relate to the hemodynamics that Colin just showed you and Dr. Karl Meyer in metastenosis is the pressure gradients, the pressure build up, the strain either in the lungs or the strain in the heart. And you have to keep that in mind because the valvaria is only a measure and the gradient has to do not only with the valvaria but with the flow. So for example, some of the most symptomatic patients that you will see will have moderate metastenosis, moderate MR. Both are moderate, but the combination of the two produce a very high gradient or moderate AS, moderate AI. Both are moderate. The combination produces a very high gradient. So when you have these combined lesions where you have high flows to the valves, everything changes. So just, just keep that in mind. So let's talk about AI. And um, we've talked a little bit about the guidelines. Uh, really, the guidelines is a really nice document. Uh, first of all, it has a lot of good educational stuff, great references that you can find. And uh, like Colin says, our guidelines, they're not the last word on everything, but really have uh, a lot of good advice. And actually this last uh, update, they really try to do a good job in very, being very clinical. So let's talk about AI. Um, first of all, acute AI, it's very easy. Uh, usually decisions to manage acute AI are very similar to symptomatic AS, Tr fix them or let them die, because uh, people with acute AI don't have a nice day. Uh, number one cause is endocarditis, 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 endocarditis. Number two cause is, of course, type one dissection, and very rarely is a knife uh, in the chest. So, um, <laughs> so these people are not happy, okay? <laughs> they're not happy. They're, they're usually pretty symptomatic, and they're acutely ill. The trick here is you have a very sick patient, blood pressure 100 over 40, and you hear nothing. That's what you have to keep in mind. Murmurs are often absent, okay? And the key is a guy with a BP of 100 but a diastolic of 30. That's the key. That's what has to get your, your brain thinking, okay? And that's, this is the hemodynamic, okay? You have acute AI, wide open AI, and the LV pressure just drops right on. Diastolic pressure goes up, creates very little turbulence, therefore very little murmur, when you get to echoes and you do the CW, you see this very rapid descent of the velocity, and the mitral valve frequently closes early because as this pressure rises, left atrial, there's not enough gradient between the left atrium and the LV, okay? So that's the typical hemodynamics. And basically, uh, you fix them and you let them die. I mean, really, these people don't do well. In the setting of endocarditis, the typical decision making here is when. It's not if, but when. You know, how fast do we go? Can we temporize? Can you give antibiotics for a little while? Or is this guy too sick to wait? We just simply have to go in and, and do the best we can. So those are, as, as I said, most of the time, not difficult decisions. Uh, the most complicated decision is really the timing of issues where you have the ID guys and you have the cardiologists and the surgeons and all three of them trying to scratch their head to decide what to do. Chronic AI, of course, is a whole different ballgame. And in terms of etiologies, um, you have the congenitals, bicuspid aortic valve, which actually you can see all the way to 90. Uh, there was a classic study by Dr. Roberts, the pathologist, who showed nicely looking at specimens of elderly people that still a lot of them had bicuspid aortic valve. Problem is that when you get a lot of calcium in a valve, it's very hard by echo to determine if they are tricuspid or, or, or um, bicuspid. So bicuspid, of course, is a very important, uh, most commonly presenting younger in the middle age. Um, and then you have all these diseases of the aorta that will produce dilation of the annulus. And of course, when the annulus dilate, the leaflets do not touch each other very well, and you get a regurgitant orifice, and you have AI. But the disease is really at the level of the aortic annulus and the aortic root. And there's a whole list of them. And likewise here, in this group here, all of these are diseases of the aorta. So this group and this group are all diseases that affect the aortic root, stretching of the aortic valve, and therefore 
uh, regate and orifice. This is the most common of them. Rheumatic disease, you hardly ever will see. Once in a while, you might. Um, that area aorta with hypertension is a very common cause of AI, but usually mild AI doesn't cause anything. And again, this is dam a dozen. A day, you won't go through a day in the echo lab without seeing some 70-year-old guy that has some calcium in the aortic valve and some AI. So this is probably, perhaps, the most common valvular lesion in America, if you want to um, be, be dogmatic. But it doesn't cause any harm. People just walk around happily with their trays to one plus AI. And hardly ever, unless they get a yes, will uh, that cause any problem. All right. So um, when you get into the real AI, which is the one that becomes more like this, moderate to severe, then unless something dramatic happens, which can sometimes, um, usually this is a chronic illness that you have plenty of time to follow the patient, uh, determine when they get symptoms, and determine what to do. So they go asymptomatic for many years. The memory is always there. Uh, and usually, as you start getting worse and worse AI, systolic pressure starts rising. Diastolic, of course, uh, goes down. And there's a whole long list of beautiful signs that were developed over the years in the days that people were observed till the, the time they died because there was no surgery. And you can read them at your leisure when you look at your slides. I have to tell you that probably the most practical of them is, number one, very prominent carotids. You put your hands in the neck, and those things are shooting very strongly. That's very helpful. The second one that is very helpful, if you were to take your time and do it, is blood pressures in the leg. Normally, blood pressures in the leg are a little higher than in the arms. But if they get higher, between 40 and higher, usually you're dealing with very significant AI. So that's a, another little trick that you could use um, if you want to do something in the, at the bedside or in the clinic and impress your attending. Um, and of course, this would be somebody with severe AI uh, in echo. Um, this is not an echo lecture, so you will have plenty of time in the echo lab when you do your rotations to learn how to do this. Um, so basically, we talk of AI in terms of mild, moderate, and severe, but we really like to think in terms of regate and volumes. We'll get to that in a minute. And of course, um, there are some color Doppler criteria that we use for mild, moderate, severe. Vena contracta width, which is right here at the onset of the AI as it passes right through the tips of the leaflets. And then CW criteria that we integrate. Um, and very nicely is in the descending aorta or abdominal aorta is looking at how much retrograde velocity you get back, because this is the AI. This is the blood going back to the ventricle. And if you look at the guidelines that were published a few years back on assessment by echo of valvular heart disease, the big, the big, the big instruction here is integrate. Do not put your eggs in one basket. Look at multiple findings together before you make your conclusion. Now, again, what the heart is feeling is not a color Doppler vena contracta. What the heart is feeling is a regatant volume, a load. There's a volume load. So we think in terms of milder AIs being usually 30 mLs or less, or 30% regatant fraction, severe being 50 or more, and then moderates are all over the place. Um, some people can become symptomatic in mo at moderate. When you get into higher volume loads, the heart has to get bigger. So it's hard to talk about severe chronic AI with an LV diameter of five. It makes no sense, okay? Now acute, that's different. But chronic, it makes no sense. You need to have LV enlargement. It's almost mandatory because it's a chronic lesion and you get a chronic volume load, okay? Um, rarely ever we do, we do any angiographic quantitation. People don't even do an aortic root anymore since we have so many other good techniques. Echo Doppler and now CMR have truly taken over the assessment of this lesion. And but for regatant volumes, we compare the aortic stroke volume with either the mitral or pulmonic, or you do an LV to the stroke volume, and then you, uh, you, you uh, compare to the um, mitral or, or pulmonic. And we see MR, some, there's some beautiful techniques that uh, hopefully Deep and showed you. So today, we have ways, if you do a good job, to figure out most of the time how bad the lesion is, okay? Uh, rarely do we have to go to a TE for AI, but sometimes we have to. If, the, uh, if you don't have a CMR available and your echo quality is not that great, 
then you may have to use uh, TE. Now, how do you treat these patients? Well, you have a lot of time to think about it. You don't have to rush. They're chronic diseases. They're going to see you in the clinic uh, quite frequently. Um, I'm sorry, this is acute AI. Um, as I said earlier, uh, treat, uh, fix them or, or let them die. Now, um, chronic AI. So you're going to have a lot of time to think about it. If the lesion is mild, you don't have to worry about it. Nothing has to be done. If it's severe, that's when you start talking about symptoms and when to do things. Moderate, most of the time don't need anything unless a couple of things happen. If you have moderate AI and moderate AS, I already told you. So presence of stenosis is going to change a moderate lesion into very symptomatic. But more commonly then is you have aortic root disease that you need to intervene, or uh, occasionally you have some patients that are elderly hypertensive, and that moderate amount of volume overload is enough in top of the hypertension to make it symptomatic. First, you treat the hypertension. But if you cannot get them asymptomatic or better with that, you sometimes have to intervene. Those are very selective cases that you have to deal with. So uh, chronic AI, however, um, you can see that if they get symptoms, they don't have a, a, you know, a good curve. So obviously, even beginning of early symptoms, start separating around five years in terms of compared to asymptomatic people. So symptoms are important, no question about it. Whoops, what happened here? <laughs> Somebody doesn't like me. How did, how did that happen? Um, anyone here cares to read what's saying here right here? <laughs> All right, I don't know how that happened, so any of you can help me? All right. All right, here we go. Okay, so um, if you have chronic severe AI and you have symptoms, straight shot, easy decision. Equivocal symptoms, which is quite often in the clinic because these people can be sedentary and their only exercise is pushing the remote control. In those cases, a treadmill can be very helpful. So exercise is recommended to bring out symptoms when you have concern that the patient may not be uh, active enough. Um, now, if they are totally asymptomatic and they have a good LV function, EF of over 50%, they do very well. However, if they already have an EF that goes under 50, they don't do well at all, okay? And if they have symptoms, it's a problem too. So the trick here is you follow them in the clinic and you want to recommend surgery before LV dysfunction, a, or if they get symptoms with normal LV function, that's an easy one, okay? And the reason for that is that if you wait too long and you do valve replacement when the EF is already dropping, then the outcomes are not so good in terms of survival as well as onset of heart failure after valve replacement. Now, you can predict when the EF is going to drop. That's the good news. Because before the EF drops to 50 or less, usually the heart gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it gets bigger at end systole. So it's your end systolic diameters or end systolic volumes, if you did uh, uh, volume studies, that are the ones that are going to help you. And usually by the time you get to around five, which is an end systolic volume of around 200, it's a big heart, you get into a lot of trouble. So you want to intervene somewhere before this mark here. And these are again the guidelines that were just recently published, showing you simply that when you have severe AI, asymptomatic, if the F is 50 or better, then you use your end systolic measurements to recommend either serial follow up or interventions. Okay? Pretty much what I just mentioned earlier. So the end systolic diameter can be extremely helpful. You can do it by echo, you can do it by CMR, you can do end systolic volumes by CMR. The trick, however, here is accuracy and reproducibility. So this is a place where you really have to take care in doing it. Uh, today we recommend that you make these measurements by 2D echo, that way you can know exactly where you're making them instead of end mode, because end mode can be extremely variable. Number two, ideally the same lab every time. So people can review previous studies. By the time they do the measurements, if patients are going to 
every day to a different place, a different lab, is a chaos. It's very, very hard to have re reproducibility. So this is one area where you people sh really should be followed by the same group, same lab, because that's where you have the best um, reproducibility. So echo has to be done with great technique. Uh, we recommend to the echo measurements. Cardiac MRI, I think, is extremely helpful. Actually, sometimes we have more trouble uh, determining the severity of AI than MR. So uh, in the echo lab, AR can be at times a little bit more tricky to assess than MR, particularly in the elderly. The 30, 40 year old patient is easy because those people have bicuspid valve and they usually follow all the rules that the book has set that I just mentioned to you. This is 75 year old who have hypertension and diabetes and coronary disease and, and come see now and the AI you're trying to, you know, the heart has gotten big but not huge. So you have a heart of six but not seven. And uh, the valve looks a little, you know, looks bad and the AI looks like, uh, and those cases is, are the ones that frequently we have more trouble with and uh, we're finding uh, MRI being extremely helpful. Thank you very much. Um, what is next? Um, Oh, we're going to fix everything now by surgery. Is that correct, uh, Dr. Ramlawi? We're going to try. All right. All right. Let's see what the surgeons can do these days. They're getting scared now.